let's talk a little bit about uh, what happens in the presence of photo uh, excitation of semiconductors. We've talked about thermal excitation. Let's talk about photo excitations. What's going to happen when we have our immersed semiconductor material, this n-type semiconductor material in solution with this depletion layer at the surface? Well, not much is going to happen if we have an accumulation la la layer there because remember that's going to be basically like our um, metal surface. So we're going to mostly be talking about surfaces with a, a band gap bending or the bands bending up. Now if a photon comes along with energy greater than the energy of the gap, the electron will be pro promoted from the valence band to the conduction band so we'll get a electron promotion into the valence band due to the absorption of light by the semiconductor material. So we'll get what they call an electron hole production. Now if there was no bending of the bands, what's going to happen is that those electrons holes, even though they're just separated in energy, they're not separated in space necessarily. So they can recombine and they will recombine pretty efficiently typically. Now, if there is a bending of the bands though, now there's a potential energy, there's a local field for those materials to become separated. There is now can be an acceleration down the energy gap band for the uh, electrons because remember this is a, um, because of the way we've, we've got the things. And so the electrons will, will uh, move away from the surface and the holes will move towards the surface. So now we now have, we're going to have not only already an increase in holes in the surface, we're going to have uh, an increase in holes because of the photo effects. <coughs> so again, this is N type E greater than E flat band. P type would have a similar sort of thing. Uh, it would have to have the E less than the E flat band for P type. So the surface charge is what's re required. We have to have these bending of the bands in order to have an efficient separation of the charges to avoid the recombination effect. What's going to happen now if we put that material in solution? Well, if we put a system in that material in a solution and we did a experiment where we scanned the potential negative to the point at which a redox couple might exist at, if we look at a platinum electrode, for example, you might see our OR couple at platinum having a wave something like that, right? Um, but if we put our semiconductor material in there, nothing's going to really happen until we get to a point um, that's really what we call the breakdown voltage of our semiconductor and we'd start to see some reaction at that point. However, if we put in our system a source of photons, what we'd observe uh, ideally is a wave at much more positive, um, at much more negative potentials than we would normally see that potential. And we call that a photocurrent. And this is a, again an n-type semiconductor. And what's happening here? Well, if we have a redox couple in the system, we have to go sufficiently um, positive to do that reaction. But if we have an n-time semiconductor and now the presence of the light allows some additional energy to be present, present in the charge carriers that are in the semiconductor themselves. So the light assists the oxidation and we are talking about an oxidation not a reduction here remember. So we've got holes which are available now for oxidation of the material. Oxidation, remember, is taking electrons away from whatever we're oxidizing. So those electrons in the solution can be, um, can be put in to the 
species R, which then gets converted to species O. Since there is no uh, electrons there now at the surface, or no electrons at the surface for species O to take up, there's no corresponding reduction of O again. So we're going to get our holes going to the species R, which converts it to species O. Or you can think of electrons going the other way, if you like. Uh, either way is correct. So what that does is that the light effectively decreases the potential at which that oxidation is required. Uh, the amount of current that you get is going to be related to the intensity of the light because that's going to be given how much holes are going to be produced in that particular system. And the frequency of the light is going to give some indication of where that uh, wave starts. Okay. So that photocurrent can be used to catalyze reactions that would otherwise not occur. So things that would normally be very difficult to oxidize can be catalyzed by the addition of, of light. For example, uh, titanium dioxide can be uh, doped into an N semiconducting form in 0.5 molar KCl. Now under, under those conditions, we would not normally see much of an anodic current under, for a wide range of potentials, particularly for titanium dioxide, which is not a particularly conductive material. It's just a, it's the same, it's the stuff they use for, say, paint pigments and so on. It doesn't conduct electricity. But if you have it N-doped, what can happen is that in the dark, you're not going to see much of anything out to about four volts in the anodic direction at which point the material starts to break down. Um, in the cathodic direction, you will see some current at some point, for example, for the proton reduction. Because at that point, remember, when we have n-type materials, if we bias it positively enough cathodic, we're going to be at a point where it's below the flat band potential and we're going to get um, metallic type conduction, so the n-type material becomes metallic effectively, and so we're going to get a normal metal type behavior, in this case, the proton reduction. If, and this is in the dark, if we add light to our system, now some things change. If we illuminate, we see the same curve as before for the cathodic branch, but now we start to see current like so, and that would be a photocurrent. And then if we add double the illumination, we get double the current. Okay. And basically the reaction is going to be holes are going to react with water to give oxygen and hydrogen ions. So the holes, you can think of the holes now as a reagent to add directly to the system. And that's one way to do uh, electrochemistry. Rather than adding electrons, we're adding electron vacancies to the system and can drive the production of oxygen at much lower redox potentials. So that's one of the reasons why titanium dioxide is often used as a as an oxidative catalyst by adding titanium dioxide and UV light, you can efficiently generate holes which now can oxidize materials. And so people have proposed using titanium dioxide on, um, in uh, waste remediation systems where they, they would mix titanium dioxide particles and illuminate it and you will get pretty efficient removal of the waste. Um, I think in Japan they've got some, uh, and it's probably coming to the US, it might be a little bit of hokey, but they, some, for example, windows are coated with titanium, a thin titanium dioxide layer, and they claim it's a self-cleaning uh, window because all the dirt and debris that deposits on there and the presence of illumination gets oxidized to small molecules like carbon dioxide and then they wash right off. And so they claim that you never have to wash your windows with a titanium dioxide coating. Um, of course have to believe that to see that. What happened to the electrons that jump to the 
Yes. Okay, well those, those are the electrons that we're seeing here, okay? Those electrons now flow out in the external circuit. So that to, in order to support a current, we have to have electrons. So that the, the holes have added to the water here, mm -hmm. and the electrons have been promoted to the, valent, the conduction band. Those now get drained away by the fact that we're adding a positive bias to the system, so those electrons get uh, dragged out, essentially, under the voltage that we've applied. And that's the current that we see is those electrons flowing in that direction. Okay, but, but what happens if we don't have a, if we don't have a, an external circuit? What, what happens, for example, if the right. when we use it for waste remediation, what happens to the electrons that jump to the conduction? And what you need then is a, a sink for the electrons, some other chemical species that will accept those electrons at the potentials that we're, we're having here. So you need some sort of electron acceptor in the system as well. And so what you'd normally have is something that, this is a catalyst, not a, not a magical bean. It, you have, it's, it's something that could normally occur anyway, but you can have the electrons shuttle through this pathway that, so that the, um, you get a driving force for the oxidation and then the electrons can go somewhere else. Is it something that is going to happen spontaneously, or you need you need that uh, that circuit? You have to have you have to have a light in the present because what you that gives us about one in this case it gives us about minus one volt, uh, approximately one volt um, under potential. Water normally would not be oxidized until we got out to about uh, um, one. Uh, two volts, I think. So uh, uh, we're oxidizing at much lower potentials than normal. And so that one volt under potential is directly related to the light that we've added. So the light is adding that energy that drives that one volt under potential. So um, it's, the titanium dioxide is, a, I don't know if, it, it's a photocatalyst. We have to have light added to the system. So it's adding, it's energy in the system. So it's not, may not fit the direct definition of a catalyst, but uh, it, it's not itself changed by the process. So it's a catalyst in that sense. So, but it, the light is essential part of the system. But you do need additional, you do need somewhere for the electrons to go, so you do need some sort of acceptor for the electrons to, 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 be, to be pushed off into it. And that could be simple as, uh, for example, you could, um, add underneath your window a layer of uh, tin oxide, indium tin oxide, which is uh, metallic. And that metallic layer can be polarized, and so you could add a, a metal uh, metallic screen underneath that's transparent that to drain away the electrons that way. So, but for uh, waste remediation, you'd have to add in uh, some sort of sacrificial species or work it out so that well, some other reductant is available in the system. You can use it then to clean water contaminated with organics and metal, metal ions. You will reduce the metals and yeah. oxidize the organics. Yeah. The problem is that if the metals reduce on the titanium dioxide, then it's, it drops the light collection and so on. So, there, so yeah, yeah, people have lots of ideas for that, and you'll see thousands of papers on this basic idea. but. Um, and it does work for certain systems. So there's a lot of pr sometimes practical problems with it. It's a very inexpensive reagent, so that's one of the reasons why so many people are interested in doing it. Of course, and this system would be f potential dependent. The, one of the problems with it is that um, it requires ultraviolet light to do this. Now, a normal solar radiation has enough ultraviolet light to drive the reaction It'll, it'll go, but you would normally have to supply, to do a really good job, you'd have to supply a, a large amount of ultraviolet light, which is not available, and normal solar light is not, um, is not enough to really do it efficiently. But if you have like a big pond or something, you could slowly do it, that'd be fine. 
So, and P-type materials would have what they call a photocathode current instead of a photoanode current, and uh, those photocathodes would drive reductions at under potentials rather than oxidations at under potentials.